the coding sequence of a single gene can be, and often is, separated in the genome by long non-coding sequences, also called introns. This discovery revolutionized our understanding of the organization, regulation, and evolution of genetic material. This discovery has an ongoing impact on everything that has to do with biotechnology, including, obviously, medicine and biofuels. For this discovery, Rich was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1993. In his Nobel autobiography, Rich describes the discovery. He says, we had excellent biochemical evidence for the split genes, but the real proof was elusive, and that's from a biochemist. In the end, says Rich, he and his colleagues, some of them are with us in the audience today. They are a faculty here at the U. Um, so Rich and his colleagues saw the split genes in the electron microscope by direct visualization. Well, we at the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute know that seeing is believing. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. After the discovery of split genes, uh, Rich took on what might be called to, in today's terminology the adenovirus genome project. The 36 kilobase pair DNA sequence of the adenovirus genome was completed in 1985. Rich says, this required a lot of computer software development. I had trouble convincing Jim Watson, and that's Watson of the DNA Double Helix fame and the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Labs at the time. So Rich says, I had trouble convincing Jim Watson that computers were essential for modern biology. Don't worry, Rich. We at the ski are all believers. <laughs> Additional discoveries include base flipping, which we found in 93, where methylated base is flipped completely out of the DNA double helix, making it accessible for chemical rea reaction. And I could go on, but I should leave Rich something to talk about and some time to talk about it. So sit back, relax, and let Rich show you the way of using database construction, visualization, and algorithm design to elucidate life on the molecular level. Uh, please help me welcome Rich Roberts. Well, thank you. It's uh, always embarrassing to be introduced. <laughs> I might say, uh, as far as Jim Watson was concerned, he told me at one time that we were not going to have computers at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory other than over his dead body. However, <laughs> we did get computers and he's still alive. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do today is to talk about a project that actually has had a, a reasonably long history, at least in the mind, in my mind and in the mind of one or two other people, but re only recently has managed to come to fruition, and that's this project Combrex. And it's a project that is aimed at solving something that a lot of computational biologists don't view as a problem because they've not really thought about it and, and don't know that, that it fully exists. And the problem comes from the unbelievably large amounts of DNA sequence that we're getting at the moment, um, you know, these days it's possible to get essentially a complete bacterial genome sequenced in a matter of an hour or two. It takes a little longer to do the computational analysis of it, so the actual getting of the data is now faster than the computational analysis. But one of the problems is that that computational analysis is very difficult, and it is not being done terribly well at the moment. And it's not because the computer algorithms are bad or because the computer scientists doing it or the bioinformaticians doing it are bad. It's just that there is an underlying data set that is needed to annotate genomes that does not exist. So there are a, a, I, I sort of pose this as a question. Why do we keep sequencing DNA? Well, one of the things is I think we all believe that DNA sequence... Um, tells us all we should know about an organism. That is basically everything that is necessary to instruct an organism as to how to behave and what to do is all in the DNA sequence. And there is a general feeling that more DNA sequence is better. Uh, I think almost every biologist you talk to will tell you that it is incredibly important 
to get more and more DNA sequence. And if you look at things like the Cancer Genome Project, like all of these GWAS studies, like almost anything you can think of at the moment, everybody is rushing to get huge amounts of sequence. There are companies that are doing this. Um, everybody, I think, in 10, 15 years likes to think that their genome sequence will be available, that every baby born in the, in the U.S. and maybe in the Western world will have its DNA sequence determined automatically. And there is this sort of um, nebulous, almost, notion that if you do that, and if we, um, if we are able to get all of this sequence, somehow we will be able to interpret it, and we will be able to tell you what genetic diseases you're going to get uh, and all the rest of it, and hopefully cure them. Well, I, I, I think that, that's probably not quite accurate. And there's also a feeling that the faster we can sequence DNA, the better, uh, because the faster we will be able to understand life. And understanding the basics of life will help medicine, it'll help industry, it'll help energy, it, it will just be generally good for everybody. Well, steps one, two, and three... I think uh, uh, maybe not quite so true, but step four, I think, really is true. But there is a big disconnect between having the DNA sequence and really understanding it, really know what is the information that is contained within that DNA sequence. <clears throat> now, how do we go about interpreting that sequence? Well, of course, the first thing we've got to do is find the genes. Now, in bacteria and in archaea, that's relatively easy. In these cases, the genes come in a nicely, linearly organized fashion. It's a nice starting point for the gene. There's a nice end point. Uh, and you can just read the sequence three bases at a time. You can translate it into protein. You have a pretty good idea of what the gene is. In eukaryotes, that is far more difficult. So... Unfortunately, in 77, we discovered introns and split genes, and that really complicated all eukaryotic organisms unimaginably. And today, even though we have quite good algorithms that are able to locate genes in, organ in eukaryotic organisms, we don't do it with 100% precision. There are still cases where we do not know what is going on between alternative splicing of exons. There are still times when we can't even recognize exons when they're very short with any great precision. And so that becomes a problem. Finding the genes in prokaryotes is easy, in eukaryotes is still quite difficult. Now, of course, having found a gene, you really want to know what is the function of the gene. If you've got a gene, it's encoding a DNA polymerase then that's a really useful piece of information to have because you can say, ah, this is the gene that's responsible for replicating the DNA, for making the next generation, and so on. But for lots of genes, it is quite difficult to determine what the function is. You can't just look at the sequence and then go to GenBank and compare it with other things and figure out what that sequence is. It actually requires some work to do it. And the computer programs that try to do this are not terribly good, and they're not terribly good for a, a reason that I will elaborate on a little later. Now, let's say we knew the function of all the genes. Let's say I've got E. coli, I've got all the genes, I know what everything does. The next thing you want to know is how all of these gene products interact with one another. What, it, what is the kind of network that will allow the metabolism of E. coli to take place, that will allow replication to take place, that will allow all of the functions of E. coli to happen. And finally, if we really want to say we understand an organism, if I want to say, well, I really understand how E. coli works, the challenge really, from my point of view, is, well, how do we build a computer program that will actually behave in silico exactly the way that this organism will behave in vivo? If I challenge it with this, I challenge it with that, can the computer program predict all of the aspects of that organism. At that point, I'd say we do really understand the organism. And as you will see, as we go on in this talk, we are rather a long way from being at that stage, even with the very simplest of organisms. So assigning function turns out to be a very hard problem. 
Now, in 2004, I was already aware of the fact that there was a lot of DNA sequencing coming. A lot of new DNA sequence was showing up in GenBank every day. Uh, but it wasn't at an absolutely alarming rate. It was coming in at a, a modest rate. But it was clear that there was a huge disconnect between the rate with which new genes were being found and the rate with which their functions were being determined. And this was a, a big problem for many, many reasons, because unless we started to tackle it, in my view, back in the early 2000s, we were never going to come to grips with it, because you could already see that the rate of DNA sequencing was going up and up and up, and the rate of doing the biochemistry or the genetics to define the function of these genes was just piddling along at a very, very slow rate. So this was a problem. So there were several things that, that I tried to do. The first thing I did, I wrote this little essay which appeared in PLOS Biology pointing out the problem, but actually proposing a solution. And when I wrote this, I got a number of nice emails and telephone calls coming back in saying, well, yeah, this was a really important problem and that we should do something about it. And one of those came from Tony Fauci, who is, was then and still is the head of NIAID. And he, like so many other people, recognized that we really had to do something in order to find out what was the function of all of these genes. Um, and he liked the proposal that I made, and I'll tell you in detail about the proposal I made in a few minutes. But there was a lot of encouragement to do something. And he said in particular, why don't we organize a little conference down in Washington, something where we can get the people who are actually into functional genomics and into um, this entire problem to come and talk about the kind of things they're doing, and let's get the funding agencies to send representatives to listen to all of these presentations and see if they can't come up with some way that we could fund an initiative to get this stuff started. Well, I thought this was a great idea. We ran the conference under the auspices of the American Academy of Microbiology. Um, everybody liked the conference. The funders said, oh, this is great. But they said, the problem is that what you're asking for is just small amounts of money to individual labs to um, look at function, and we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to give away small amounts of money. We only know how to give away large amounts of money. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I found this very disappointing. I suggested they could just give all the money to me, and then I would give away the small amounts. <laughs> but at the time, they didn't seem to like that. So just to show you the nature of the problem in, in sort of fairly graphic detail, Okay. If you look at the costs of getting DNA sequence, and this just runs up to 2010, and in fact there's been another massive increase in productivity and throughput in the sequencing machines these days, you can see that the cost of getting sequence is just going down and down and down. The number of base pairs that you get per dollar is just shooting way, way up. And there's no sign that it's stopping. There's absolutely no sign. All of the companies who are making sequencing machines are coming up with better and better versions. There are new technologies on the market which promise at least a 10 to 100-fold increase in the number of bases per dollar that you can get. Uh, and you can imagine where this is going. And what does this mean? It means that we're going to be finding more and more and more genes for which we don't know the function. This is a problem. Now you might ask, why has there been so little movement? Why has there been so little interest and so little progress in getting a gene function when it's clearly important, you know? There are, there are institutes out there. Lee Hood has this Institute of Systems Biology. Now to me, systems biology means that you're going to take a genome, you're going to say, I know the function of all of the genes, and I'm going to study what can happen when you network all of these genes and when you put them all together and hopefully understand how the organism works. However, if you don't know the function of half the genes, how are you ever going to build and take a systems approach to trying to understand an <coughs> organism? It, it just makes no sense. It's like saying, well, you know, I've got this car, and I'm really going to try and understand how this car works, 
But unfortunately, only half the components do I have any clue of what they do. Now, I'm not going to actually bother about working out what the others do. I'm going to build a high-level model and work it all out. I think it's nonsense. I think it's absolute nonsense. We have to work out what are the function of the genes. Once we have that, then we can begin to make some progress, I would argue. Now, it's a difficult problem. And the reason it's a difficult problem is that if I give you just a sequence of, say, 300 amino acids, at the moment, we are not able, even able to predict how that will fold. That is, we can't make a prediction and say, oh, this is going to make a nice little pocket that will have an ATP binding site in it, or this is a nice protein that is likely to bind to DNA because of this plot pocket, this cleft that is present. We are not doing a very good job so far of predicting structure. How about predicting function? Well, unfortunately, the way in which almost all functional annotation currently takes place is by a computer program that goes, takes a new sequence, compares it to everything in GenBank, and essentially polls the results to find the things that is closest and assume it's going to have the same function. And so what this means is that let us say <coughs> I have a protein, a new protein. It's got 90% similarity. 90% of the amino acids are absolutely identical to a protein that's already in GenBank that is labeled DNA methyltransferase. If I then take another protein that comes along and I see, oh, it's got 90% similarity to this thing that I've just labeled DNA methyltransferase because of the similarity to the thing that we know is a DNA methyltransferase. This too must be a DNA methyltransferase. And I think you can quickly see that as you go further and further away from the thing that you really knew what it did, before long you've got things that have essentially no similarity to the original thing where you knew the function, where someone had done the biochemistry and you knew what was what, to a point where you're labeling things as DNA methyltransferases that are highly unlikely to be anything like a DNA methyltransferase. And I think we all know, those of us who do any sort of biology, that point mutations, a single amino acid changing in the wrong place will change the catalytic activity, it will change the substrate specificity, it will change the way in which the protein folds, it will have untold consequences. And one cannot just assume, because <coughs> two things are pretty similar, that they're going to have the same function. At some point, this has to be tested. In fact, the problem is even, even worse than that, because very often it is not easy to find out which protein the function was tested in. You might have thought that, say, in E. coli, we would know exactly which proteins had which functions, and they'd all been tested. In fact, the function of proteins in E. coli have almost all been tested in different strains of E. coli, um, places where perhaps the, the protein sequence is a little different from the reference sequence, which is the one that Fred Blattner um, did a few years ago. And, and we don't know. The, 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 the sequence of the protein that came out of the reference sequence is likely never to have been tested directly biochemically for its function. Only about 800 proteins in E. coli MG 1655, which is sort of the reference sequence, have ever been tested directly for function. The tests have been done on other strains called E. coli in somebody's lab. Maybe they're all good, maybe everything is okay, but the point is there is no traceable record that is easily obtained as to where that function was determined. And I'll talk a little more about that later too. Now the other thing is very often you need quite a cross-disciplinary set of skills in order to really work out what a function is. Um, maybe you need some biochemistry, maybe you need some genetics, uh, maybe you need to do a little biophysics to really work out what's going on. You perhaps have to do kinetics in order to work out that substrate A is the real, likely to be the real substrate, <laughs> substrate B is just not that good a substrate. Another problem, actually, has been the appeal of genome-wide studies. Okay, so at the moment, you go, you write your grant, you go down to NIH, and the study section looks at it, and if it got 
anything in it that says, oh, this is terribly high throughput, and, and this is really a genome-wide study of everything that's going on. We're going to look at all the messenger RNAs that are made all at once. And um, study sections love this. They, they think that gathering all this huge amount of data is inherently a very good thing, very often without thinking about what you're really going to learn from all of these studies. But if I go down and say, well, I've got this family of proteins. Um, I'm pretty certain that they're all glycosyl hydrolases. Don't really know what the substrate is, but I would like to make a panel of substrates and then just check, test these various genes one at a time to find out what they're really doing. Um, unlikely you'll get funding. Um, NIH simply doesn't like this kind of stuff. Biochemistry is old-fashioned. It's not high throughput. No one really cares about it anymore. And yet... In order to get at the function of most of these genes, someone's going to have to do this biochemistry, and someone's going to have to do a little genetics too. And, of course, there is a lack of appropriate funding mechanisms. NIH just doesn't like this sort of stuff, so that becomes a big problem. So, now back to my original paper. The way that I proposed that we solve this problem of functional annotation was by first forming a database of functional predictions. So just think, let's say we take E. coli, we look through the genome of E. coli, and we do the best we can to predict what is the function of every gene. Now, there are many ways that one can go about doing that. The simplest, of course, is just to look for the nearest homologue in GenBank and hope that whatever is the nearest homologue, um, there was actually some biochemistry done on that gene. Um, another way is to look at things that lie in operons and try to work out what, say, maybe missing functions are. But there, there are a lot of clever ways that bioinformaticians have come up with to try and make good predictions of function. And so what I'm saying is let's get all of the, biochem all of the bioinformatics folks that we can to come up with their predictions. We will put all the genes into a database. We'll annotate them with all of these predictions. And then we will get these predictions tested. And this is the problem at the moment. There are lots of people who make predictions, uh, but typically people don't want to test other people's predictions. You know, they, they like to test their own predictions, or if they're bioinformatics folks, they just want to put them out there and then get on with the next interesting problem. And so there's been a, a great dearth of interest in actually making predictions and testing them. You know, which, after all, is what science is really all about, isn't it? At least that's what I was taught when I, when I was growing up. So th there's been a big disconnect here. So we thought, let's form this database, put all the predictions in, and now the novel approach is we'll say, well, let's encourage biochemists who have a particular interest in any given function that is in this database and allow them to say, well, I will test that function and we'll give them a small grant to do so. Now, these are projects that very often um, are, can easily be carried out by an undergraduate. They can be carried out by a graduate student, a technician. You, you often don't need to be terribly skillful yourself. You just need to be in a lab that has the necessary skill set to tell you how to do the assay, to teach you to do the assay, that they have the substrates that are needed, and that they can design an experiment that will allow you to test that function. And my idea was that for sort of, you know, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, you could give a small grant to a lab. They could perhaps take on a few of these genes, test for function, uh, and then they could report back on those results, and then we'll move on and get more. And if we could get a large number of biochemists interested in doing this, you could imagine getting lots of undergraduates, graduate students, all involved in doing this kind of thing. And of course, once you've proved a function, this is a publishable result. And so here actually is a way that an undergraduate or a graduate student could apply for a grant and get a result and get a publication out of it. Not a bad undergraduate thesis. Not a bad idea for a, a rotation project for a first-year graduate student. And you get some money out of it. You get the prestige of it. You've got the paper. I thought this was, this was a winner. I, I couldn't imagine that NIH would not think this was a great idea. But however, because I only wanted to give these labs a few thousand dollars, um, they weren't interested. They, they didn't want to do anything about it. And they basically just told me that you know, they have no mechanism for doing it, and they're not interested in setting one up. So 
That was where it stood for quite a long time. <coughs> so this is the, the basic ideas behind everything. We get high throughput by parallelizing the project. We get bioinformaticians involved to make the predictions, get the database. Biochemists test the predictions, and then we give them some money to do so. Now, two years ago, a little over two years ago, uh, I was looking through the NIH funding announcements. This was when the ARA money was first coming, the stimulus money, and all of a sudden NIH had $10 billion that they needed to spend. And lo and behold, here was a request for applications to do exactly this. I mean, it was as though I had written it. I, I could not believe this. It just recapitulated all of the stuff that was in my original essay. So in the meantime, I'd, I'd really given up on it because I didn't think it was going to happen. So I quickly found some people who were prepared to help. We put in an application to do this, and we got funded. And we basically got four million bucks to get this project started. Um, this has been going now for about a year and a half. We have the database assembled. We've got about a dozen teams out there now already doing some of these functional predictions. We're open for bids. We're looking for more people who want to come and join us. And I think our major problem at the moment is to know how we're going to get some more money because the problem with the stimulus is that after two years, all the money goes away and there is no possibility for renewal or for anything else. So we're looking around at the moment to try to find some alternative ways to get some money. But so far, things are going pretty well. Now, there are several things that have come out of doing this, um, including something that we had, we had not expected. And I will tell you about that in, in a moment. And it, it's actually number five down at the bottom. So the first thing that, that one has to do when you're putting together a database, you've got to recognize that at the moment, the current annotation, almost all of it, not, not everything, but you know, 99.9% .9 of all the new annotation going in GenBank is based on similarity to a sequence that carries a label. Okay? That label may or may not be accurate, but the computer programs don't care. If, it, if you find something, it says, oh, this is an RNA methyltransferase, then you can guarantee that the next thing that is within about 50% similarity of it will also be an RNA methyltransferase. This is just how the annotation in GenBank is. And this propagation of annotation is a major problem. It, it's a huge problem, and one that has not been addressed at all well by the bioinformatics community. And the reason that it is such a problem is that now, when you go back and start to test some of the annotations, you discover that minimally 15% of all the annotations in GenBank are simply wrong. They're just incorrect. And people are worried that the actual number is even much higher than that. So that when you find a new protein, compare it to something in GenBank, you have no guarantees that what it looks like, even though you have 30 genes all annotated the same way, you have no way of knowing how accurate those annotations are. And that is a big problem. <clears throat> so, question is, what can you do about it? What, what can we do about this? And within the context of Combrex, we're trying to do a couple of things. One is, we're certainly trying to find ways of marking when annotations are likely to be incorrect. Um, there's a lady, Patsy Babbitt, over at um, UCSF, who had a beautiful paper a couple of years ago in which she really documented some of the egregious cases of misannotation. And, and these were only the egregious cases, not even the, the fairly simple ones. And so we're encouraging more and more people who have actually found that things are incorrectly <coughs> annotated to let us know so that that information can be passed on to GenBank and so that hopefully um, GenBank can be corrected. But that is a problem. GenBank was never set up as an interactive scheme. It was set up deliberately as just an archive. And so if there is a, 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 an incorrect annotation that was put in by the author, unless the author corrects it, it will stay there. And so there needs to be some better way of marking when a GenBank record is incorrect. And GenBank have ways of doing this. They're kind of possibilities for meta-annotation routes, so that if something is wrong and there's a good reference showing it's wrong, then that can be included. So that's one thing, is we'd certainly like to do that. 
But the bottom line, and, and the thing that I was just blown away by this, is that doesn't it seem reasonable that one of these protein databases that have been going now for the last 25 years would actually have a set of what I think of as the gold standard genes. Genes where someone has shown that a protein of this sequence has this function. Right? You know, we cloned and sequenced the gene for X. Okay? That paper should be associated with this gene in some way. And we thought that Uniprot, which is by far the best database, protein database out there, that this would be the one that would have all of this information. It doesn't. There is no database out there that you can go to where you can know that a protein of this sequence was rigorously shown to have this function. That doesn't mean that it's not possible to assemble such a database. Okay? We all know that the literature is absolutely full of genes where the protein has been sequenced and the functional test was carried out on a protein of that sequence because it was carried out on the, the gene from a particular organism. But finding that in the literature is incredibly difficult. You cannot find it um, with Uniprot. You can't find it with E. coli databases. The E. coli databases have no method of tracking when a protein for which they have assigned a function they can't take you back to the original literature. It's just not there. And no one has bothered to do this. It's not in GenBank. It's not anywhere. So one of the things that we decided we would do would be, first of all, to draw attention to this problem and then fix it. Let's find a way of assembling such a, such a database. And Combrex, in conjunction with NCBI and the GenBank folks and Uniprot, are all working now to start to assemble such a function. And everybody, I was at a meeting of functional annotators not long ago, and, you know, I was asking about this, and, you know, I said, well, is there anybody out there who knows where I can find this data set? Silence. And then I said, well, you know, maybe we'll put it together, and I started to, and everybody said, oh, great idea, great idea, let's do it. I mean, this is something that should have been done 25 years ago. It's, it's, this is not the time to be doing it now, but nevertheless, we're going to get started and get that done. So now, what is exactly the gold standard protein data set? So it's a set of proteins where the function has been determined by biochemistry. I'm not talking about genetics at this point, because then that starts to get very difficult, but it, it's been determined biochemically, and the sequence is known to be accurate. That is, wherever the biochemistry was done, we know the sequence of the protein on which it was done. And so for each protein in the set, we find the reference that describes the determination of function. We make sure that the strain has been properly defined, that if it's uh, an E. coli K12, we know exactly which E. coli K12 it was. And we make sure that the DNA protein sequence determination was really done on the gene where the biochemical function was characterized. So if I see a, a protein that says, well, this is the DAM methylase gene of E. coli, if it was actually done on a strain of E. coli that is different from the standard, which is MG1655, where it turns out it's never been done, then I will not accept that one, the, the MG1655, as the gold standard. It's the strain where it was done. And of course, if the two are 100% identical in sequence, then it's pretty likely it's going to have exactly the same function. But equally, that can be dangerous when you move from one species, one <coughs> genus, to another, because there are post-translational modifications that take place, and one can never be sure unless you've looked whether a post-translational modification is somehow altering the function. So the purpose of this, this gold standard database is to know exactly the strain where it was done, exactly the sequence of the protein. Because then you have something that you can hang your hat on and you can say, oh, this particular protein is 99% identical, one amino acid different. Um, it's not gold standard because no one ever tested the function, but, you know, with a, an extremely high probability, it's going to have exactly the same function. But the point is, you can know that if you know how far it is away from the thing where the function really was. So the way in which we're going about doing this is to identify candidates for this gold standard set. And so we've got a whole bunch of proteins from um, the E. coli databases. We've got a whole lot of proteins that have come from Uniprot. 
These have all been assembled into a series of templates in which the information we need is either present, absent, and then we've asked curators to start looking through and just checking whether everything is accurate or not. And this is just a, a manual check. It typically takes maybe five to ten minutes per protein to go through it. It's something, again, that students can do very easily. In fact, there are several student projects around the country that are essentially doing this as part of the undergraduate education experience now. All they've got to do, make sure the strain information really is accurate, the biochemical characterization is accurate, and that the gene was in fact sequenced in the strain from which the protein came. And this turns out to be one of the more difficult times because it turns out people in the literature have not been very rigorous about documenting exactly where everything came from. You know, they'll say, oh, we made it from E. coli. Well, E. coli tells you nothing. You know, E. coli is an unbelievably heterogeneous group of organisms with genomes ranging, ranging from 4.5 megabases up to 6.5 megabases with plasmids, with all sorts of things in it. And so you really have to be careful and you know what's what. And that, that's what this last one is all about. Now, how can you help? Well, you know, this is why I really came here. Because I feel that there are probably many of you in this audience who could help quite a lot with a project of this sort. Um, what we're looking for are people who will be volunteers to actually do a little of this curation. Don't ask you to do very much. Essentially, all you do is you sign up, um, and you can do that by just sending me an email, um, roberts at neb.com. We will add you onto the list of curators. You will be assigned a few proteins, initially just two or three at a time. Um, as you work your way through these, you can request more. You can do it on your own time. Whenever you want to do it is fine. There's no pressure to do anything. But the more people that we can get involved in doing this, the better it's going to be for everybody. And once a curation has been done, once we, we know that something really should be gold standard, that goes back to Uniprot, they will just go over, check it, make sure everything is okay, and then it will join the gold standard data set. Our guess is that there are probably no more than 100,000 proteins out there that should be a part of this data set, and many of those will be redundant to some extent in that they're the same function from a bunch of different organisms. So what we're really trying to do is maybe assemble 30,000, 40,000 proteins that would be the, the bulk of the gold standard data set. Um, and then I think functional annotation will be improved immensely. Um, the opportunity to correct things in GenBank, the opportunity for new programs to be written that will do a better job of this curation will just go up and up and up. So I hope some of you at least will um, volunteer for this. It's not really onerous. So now let me tell you a little bit about Combrex. Um, you probably can't read this terribly well. But basically, this is the Combrex website. It's combrex.bu.edu. Uh, it's got a little search box up at the top. You can enter a gene, and then it will uh, tell you the various things that you can do on the site. Um, you can go by and uh, try and bid to, to make an experimental very, uh, validation by applying for a grant. Um, you can look at gene function predictions, see if you can find something that you're interested in and search the database for various <coughs> kinds of things. Uh, at the bottom is a list of the, three organi of the two organisms rather um, that we're mainly interested in. One of the things we want to do is we would like to finish the annotation of E. coli. Um, it would be really nice. You know, E. coli is the best studied organism out there. We really should know what all the genes do. And so anybody who comes in and says, well, I think I can predict a function and validate a function for an unknown E. coli gene, we find that incredibly valuable and uh, we likely give you a grant to do that almost immediately. Second one is Helicobacter pylori. This is the organism that causes ulcers. Absolutely fascinating organism. Biologically really interesting. Um, not a lot is known. Not a lot of functional annotation has been done. Uh, but it's a great organism. And so people who are, want to work on that and the main idea here was that we would like to show NIH that this is a way of actually making a lot of headway in dealing with pathogens. Uh, there are many pathogens of interest to NIH, tuberculosis, anthrax, all sorts of things. There's been almost no functional annotation work done on any of these pathogens. 
And if ever again we're really going to come up with creative solutions to these, we need to find a lot more out about how the organisms actually work. Um, this is just a, an indication of the kind of things you can do in Combrex and write a simple search, or you can go and do something a little more complicated. And the idea here is that if you were a biochemist and you were particularly interested in, um, say, hydrolases, you're particularly interested in DNA binding protein, transcriptional regulators, whatever, you can enter keywords and find lists of things that are potentially worth annotating. Um, no, let's, let's skip that. Okay, so in terms of those genes that are really worth doing, there are a number of criteria that we're trying to bring to bear on this so that we really focus the efforts on the things that are going to be of highest value. So one of the first things is that let us say one has a gene and it occurs in 800 organisms. 800 sequence bacterial genomes is also present in plants, also present in human, and we have no idea what it does. If someone comes up with a really good prediction for what it might do, that would be very high priority to test the function, not just in, in say, the E. coli version or one other version, but maybe in three or four different versions of this gene to see if that prediction is accurate. If it is, then this means you now have the basis for beginning to think about transferring that annotation to a large number of other genomes. So you get a lot of bang for the buck uh, by just showing a function for an unknown gene like that. E. coli, Helicobacter pylori, I told you about. These are organisms we're especially interested in because we'd like to see the annotation completed there. Is there a clone available for the gene? Um, it turns out through the Structural Genomics Initiative, there are something like 5,000 genes that have been cloned. Protein has been made. Sometimes the protein is available. Certainly the clone will be available. Um, often these are things that one has no idea um, what they do. These are proteins that were originally picked because it was thought they had novel folds and hence might have some novel functions. So there are a lot of these clones that are just readily available uh, and we've tried to put links into that within Combrex. So if, if the protein you're interested in, if there's a clone available, we can tell you exactly where to go and get it. Are structures available? Um, for some of these things that came out of the structural genomic initiatives, about 10% of all of the things that were cloned, there are now structures for. And so this allows another way of making predictions. You can go and look and see, well, could you dock a small molecule into it? Can, can you work out what it's doing? Um, is it known or predicted to be essential? Is it predicted to <coughs> fill a gap in a key network? And so on. The, these are sort of the size of the type, gives you some idea of the order of priority. But at the moment, we're mainly interested in getting more and more people involved in this so that we can get more and more experimental annotations of function taken care of. Now, who can help? Well, obviously, computational biologists can help by making predictions. And we already have something like 15 or 16 uh, bioinformatics folks who are sending us predictions who are helping work out on the prediction end of things. Biochemists, anyone who has some biochemical um, expertise, <coughs> these can be very useful because in a biochemical lab, it's typically pretty easy to do a lot of these experimental validations. Geneticists can be helpful, uh, both in terms of making predictions, but also in terms of validating some functional predictions. In terms of people, well, obviously, um, graduates, undergraduates, I've already spoken about, High school students, we are running a project at the moment with our local high school um, to get one of their better students to come to New England Biolabs and do this as a high school science fair project. Um, I think we, we have enough genes, enough expertise that we can easily uh, teach a student to do this. And in fact, we have undergraduate um, high school students come into the labs all the time to do little projects. But, but here's a, a really very nice one for them. Professors, um, quite a few professors, you know, go emeritus at some time or another. Um, they often say, oh, well, this is my opportunity to get back to the lab. Let's go and do some more lab work. Well, here's a wonderful way to do <laughs> some lab work. <laughs> and finally, of course, the funding agencies. We have to be able to convince the funding agencies that this is a good use of their money. And, and we're working on that. But um, if you see projects coming through study sections that you're sitting on, uh, 
let, let us know and, and make sure that um, we get funded. And of course, you can help. Everybody in this room can help. So the people who are involved in this project are myself, Simon Kasif, who's a computational biologist at BU, Martin Stephan is a biochemist at BU, Charles DeLisi is an emeritus professor there. He's the guy who got the Human Genome Project going. He was running research at DOE and put up the very first money to get the Human Genome Project going. Daniel Segre is an assistant professor at BU. He's interested in networks. Stephen Salzberg uh, is a computer scientist at the University of Maryland, although he's just moving back to Hopkins. Uh, he's a, a quite distinguished computational biologist. And Dennis Vitkup at Columbia University, another bioinformatician, interested in networks and so on. And of course, um, we're always happy to acknowledge all the collaborators, present and future. And I, I would thank you for the time that you've invested in listening to this. I hope some of you, at least, and will sign up either to get involved in doing some experimental work or sending in some predictions, or just serving as curators on the Gold Standard Project. I think this is something that's very much a community-based activity. It's something that we're all going to benefit. The whole of biology is going to benefit if we can pull this off because it is so important that we get these genes annotated and annotated correctly, not just what some computer thought they should be doing, but what they actually do. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. So I have a question. Is, so this is actually very interesting because this problem is actually much more general. The data collection is outpacing any data analysis and so on. And now with this type of community of work, have you thought about the validation of what people do? Okay, so for those of you who are still here, the question was, what, what are we going to do about the quality of the work that gets done? So it's all very well to sign up and do something. What about the quality? Well, for the experimental side of things, we really are going to encourage everybody to publish their results. And for instance, at the moment, it looks as though this journal PLOS One um, would be more than happy to take papers describing these kinds of results. In the event that they wouldn't, then I've actually thought about just starting a new journal specifically to publish these results. And in fact, NCBI, um, well, the National Library of Medicine has said they would include it as a PubMed uh, index journal. So publication, I think, is the way to validate the experimental work. On the computational side of things, um, there's not a lot that we can do. What we're asking is that the people who send us predictions um, actually report the papers in which the algorithms saying how they generated the predictions um, were present. So we hope that there again will be citable literature concerning the presentation, concerning the um, predictions. But in every case, if there is a prediction, there will be a name tied to it. And if you think it's wrong, then there's a, an individual who can be contacted and who will be responsible for that. Yeah. Do you criticize to you the conservation of similarity across yeah. this is the function? Mm -hmm. So when complex is available online, I mean the, the gold standard is available, yep. would you discourage people to use those information to infer the function? Right, so human? so the whole problem of propagation of function is inherently an interesting one. And it seems to me the pre key criterion that you need to know about is if I've got a new gene, if I can say this is 95% identical to this gene where the function is known, then, then you can say something. Uh, you can say this was the basis for my making this annotation. A computer program can say this was the basis for my making that annotation. At the moment, that reference, that basis, is not there. It, it just isn't there. You can't find it. And so I believe that in future, we would like to see any sorts of propagation of annotation based upon a, a, a gold standard protein of some sort and another. So you can say it's 80% similar to this, but it's not been tested. It's just a prediction. Um, if you look again in GenBank, you often see what happens is that the first time a gene gets annotated, it says, oh, 
predicted DNA methyl transferase. And after a little while, the word predicted gets lost. And then it just says DNA methyl transferase. And then you don't know. At this point, it's all over. Is it a good prediction? Is it a bad prediction? What does it look like? No idea. So, yeah. Do you think you envision like a, a mechanism to have a ripple effect when you have a prediction and it's tested and maybe it's wrong and it's different than there are all the derived predictions mm -hmm. that has to change based on that? Well, so that is what we're hoping. So this is the whole idea behind sort of the, the meta look at a GenBank file. So NCBI, have, uh, they're, they're into this, they would like to do this, so I think that definitely will follow. That as soon as a prediction or an annotation in an existing file is shown to be wrong, there absolutely will be a ripple effect. Okay? And in particular, one of the things we're focusing on is the RefSeq set of proteins. So the RefSeq database is a database for all completely sequenced genomes. And they do manual annotation of that in addition to taking whatever is available um, computationally down at NCBI. There, they can change the annotation, and for sure they're going to change the annotation as the gold protein set, the gold standard set comes along, because they're involved in this project. It, it's very much in their interest to do this and get involved in this. Any questions? So I'm just curious, yeah, how many gold standard proteins you have now? Well, you know, there are really a lot. So, for instance, um, a good example of some gold standard proteins is <coughs> DNA polymerases, okay. right? So, you know, you've got an organism, it's got one replicative DNA polymerase in. The organism lives, you can be pretty sure the DNA polymerase is accurate, that, that it really is a good thing. And there have been lots of biochemistry done on these. So, those are examples of good um, gold standard proteins. Among the ones that have been rigorously annotated, we probably just have a couple of thousand at the moment, uh, but part of the problem is that the project is still getting started. We've been doing a lot of testing um, on both the methodology for doing the curation and making sure that people are doing it properly and so on, uh, but we now feel it's at a time when we can open it up to other people and, you know, it, let, let us say we could find a thousand curators and we want to generate, say, 20,000 gold standard proteins, if everybody did just 20 proteins, then we would have 20,000 in next to no time. So, again, it's one of these cases, the more people that we can get involved, even if you only do, you know, a couple every week, you can make a big difference. You can really help out. You're a part of the community that is going to be a benefit to the whole of biology. At the moment, absolutely. Okay, so yes, okay. absolutely at the moment. And I mean, there are plenty of examples. So the proteins I know best are the restriction enzymes. Um, the majority of the putative restriction enzymes in GenBank are incorrectly annotated. I mean, they're just not accurately annotated. Oh, but say, could they have more than a single correct annotation? Right? Well, okay, so, yeah. so I, I can tell you there are proteins that have more than one function. They have two, three functions all embedded in the same protein. At the moment, some of these are correctly annotated, but a number of them will just have one of the two or three annotations in them, and others will have one of the other of the <coughs> one or two correct annotations. So that's all stuff that we're hoping are correct as a result of this. Uh, would annotations include any sort of quantitative data like on binding, or would that all just have to be like mine? Yeah, I think to start off with, because we're anxious to get this database up as fast as we can, um, you would have to go back to the original publications in order to find out about that. So our, our intention is not to make this into some really fancy um, database at the moment. We're just trying to do it so that we can get the annotation problem solved. Um, Uniprot are the people who really should be doing the kind of thing that you're talking about, and hopefully in the future they will. They're actually very embarrassed, I might add, that they've not gotten this already. Uh, there, there are several people who are quite embarrassed that they've not already got this data set together. Can you give us this talk in China, <coughs> India, or Japan? Um, Japan, no. <coughs> India, no. Um, China, in two weeks' time. I've given it in Egypt, in Qatar. 
Um, where else? Several other places. I've given it at a few places. In England, I gave it. Um, England produced a lot of um, curators, I might say. In Egypt, I gave it at a time um, that was not propitious for getting anything much done. Um, I'm hopeful at some point in the future, a few of the people who heard the talk will remember it. Yeah. Back to all this question earlier, is there any mechanism in, in the database that um, do not discourage people to find a second or third function, a third gold standard to deal with a heterotropic function? Right. Um, so, so the question is, is there something that would discourage people from trying to find a second function of a protein? And I think often that comes from the fact that once someone has one function assigned to a protein, um, the natural human reaction, unless you're very skeptical, is to say, well, that's it, and, and we'll settle for it. And usually the way that second functions have been found is because some geneticist has been looking at an example of this protein somewhere, and the genetics ju just doesn't go along with the prediction that's assigned. That usually takes a lot more work, though, to, to actually figure out what is going on. Our, our intention is not to do that at the moment. If we get one function, one protein, we know that this is what it does, we will be very happy. Um, as time goes on, I'm sure we're going to find lots of examples where it will be desirable to do more, and if the evidence is there, then the paper can be added, and, and we're happy to do that. But I think at the moment, the situation is so bad that, that something needs to be done as quickly as we can, and so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're really tight with time, so if you all have any other questions, you want to join Rich's project, you have contact information. So let us all thank you.